seguimos platicando con gente que escribe, con autores aquí en la Feria Internacional del Libro de San Miguel Allende, la Feria Internacional de Escritores de San Miguel Allende. Y, y bueno, es un gusto tener aquí a Robert Moore, quien ha escrito una primera obra, eh, El Medio Ambiente, pero eh, vinculada con los caminos, con los senderos. Y, y de esto nos va a hablar él en un momento, en un momento más. Porque, bueno, eh, Robert caminando se dio cuenta de la interconexión entre las cosas. Y, y quisiera que nos platicaras un poco cómo fue este proceso. Yeah, so the way that this book began and the way that my realization grew was I went in 2009 to hike the Appalachian Trail, which is a very long hiking path that leads from Georgia uh, to Maine. So basically from the bottom of the United States to the very top. It took me about five months to do that. And as I recount in the book, it was a very rainy year. Uh, so I had a lot of time. When it's rainy like that, you can't really look at the views. You know, oftentimes when you're hiking, it's all about looking out over the vista and seeing into the distance. But when there's a lot of clouds, you can't do that. So I was like a monk, you know, in walking meditation. I just kept my eyes down and kept walking. And as I did, I started to think about what a trail is and why that word trail and path is so prevalent across cultures as a metaphor for how we make our way through life. I, I don't know if it's the same in Spanish, but I imagine it is. So for example, the word via, right, is the same as, as way. This word means both a path and it means sort of how, how you will uh, make your way through life. You see it, in, especially in religions, that, that it's a recurring metaphor. So that idea started in my mind and I, I started investigating it. And as I did, I found that all forms of, not all forms of organisms, but on all scales of life, you find organisms which are using trails to make sense out of the chaos of landscape, right? There's this chaotic jumble of mountains or blades of grass, and you need to make yourself, you need to make your way from one place to another. How do you do that? And once you've done it, how do you pass down that information to other people? And the way you do that is a trail. You form a trail, you, you draw a line, and then other people find that line and they start walking it. Whether they're tiny ants or humans or elephants, they start walking that line and as they do, they make that line a little bit more elegant. They streamline it, they fix some of the problems that you uh, didn't foresee, some of the errors that you made. And so what results is this really beautiful structure, which is always evolving and always finding a better way to get from here to there, whether that's an actual physical trail or a metaphorical way or path through life. Pero todo eso, de pronto lo escucho, me parece muy bello, pero ¿qué pasa con estas carreteras saturadas de autos de hoy? Uh -huh. Ya no tienen que ver mucho. <laughs> Con, right. con un sendero y con un camino y con una reflexión al caminar. Yeah. So what's happening with freeways and and the highway is actually a very old thing, right? They, the, 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 the kings uh, of Europe would create highways, which were roads they would build, which would be raised up so they could shed water. And oftentimes they were created for military purposes or for regal purposes to transport the king. Also, you see it throughout Latin America. You. I'm blanking on the word, not a king, but a, uh, uh, you know, the head of, in the Inca or the Maya or the Aztec, um, they would have... Em emperors. Yeah, maybe emperors would have a special road, um, which was for them and their, uh, and their entourage, uh, and they would be carried, you know, on a, on a palanquin. And, and so that, that, the impulse to build those roads is very old, but the shape of our modern road system is because of the shape of cars, right? And so you see, actually, as uh, the weight of cars increases, for example, trucks, <coughs> you get fewer and fewer roads, but you get wider and wider highways because they need to be built to carry that load. And you result, what results are these very long, very straight, very inflexible structures, which to me are very different from a trail. They're much less beautiful because they don't, A, they don't evolve uh, as quickly. They're fixed, and so they tend to be self-reinforcing. You know, like once you build a highway, you have to keep widening the highway for more cars. There, it, it, it sort of blocks out other types, other ways of getting to that place, whether that's a, a subway system or whatever. But also, I think that they are evolved to the technology of the car, so they're deeply alienating to the human being. You know, I, in my book, I walked with a man named Nimblewill Nomad. He's this old, uh, it's his, that's his trail name. His real name is M.J. Eberhardt, but he's about, he's in his 70s now, and he gave away all of his money when he was in his 60s and started walking. 
walks every long trail in the United States and then starts walking around the roads because he basically ran out of trails. And I walked with him through East Texas and into Louisiana. And what I found was that it is a deeply disturbing uh, way to walk alongside a wide highway like that because the cars are flying by you at, at high speeds and you get no sense uh, that they even care about your life. You know, you feel very endangered at every moment. Of course, he's been doing it for years and he, nothing bad has happened to him, but other people have been killed. Very recently, a, a man, young man named Mark Balmer was killed who was walking across the country on the side of the road. So there is something slightly monstrous when you're on foot about the road network. Of course, once you get into a car, your perspective changes completely. <laughs> No sé si recuerdes el, el poema de Cavafis. ¿De qué? Un poema yeah. de Cavafis, a, a Greek author, yeah. uh -huh. about the journey, sobre el viaje. Uh -huh. es, él decía, no importa, se llama Ítaca, uh -huh. no importa llegar a Ítaca o no, sino que importa uh, todo okay. lo que el viaje te ha dado. Right. Entonces, no, I'm not, I'm not familiar with, with the poet. But. But but this but the that that sentiment is one that uh, yeah that you see again and again. Th th meaning like that it's the it's the journey that, that matters. It doesn't matter if you make yes. it there. It's the journey. No, yeah. At the end. That's an interesting. Uh, it's a really interesting thought because, on the one hand, it's completely true. If you, uh, this is my own personal experience. If you are only walking, for example, on the Appalachian Trail just to make it to the end, there are people who run it. You know, who go, who fly through, and they miss a lot. I think. Um, if you're just focused on the endpoint, but on the flip side, if you're not focused on the endpoint at all, you won't get there. <laughs> so you need a kind of balance. Um, and for me, it was it was very important for me to make it to the end of the Appalachian Trail. It, it just was a uh, it was a personal goal, and it was something I didn't want to to have to let. I, it just I just knew it would be a very significant moment for me to get there. Other writers, you know, I don't know if you've heard of Bill Bryson, but he's a the, wrote the most famous book about the Appalachian Trail. It's called A Walk in the Woods. And he actually didn't end up making it to the end. I think he made it as far as, uh, it may have been Tennessee, and then he started skipping around and he went up to Virginia and he drove around. And I remember reading that as a teenager and being very upset with it because he wasn't injured, he had no reason, he just, he just sort of had gr grown a little homesick and wanted to go home and didn't want to do this anymore. But for me, the part of the beauty of through hiking, which is what they call this type of hiking, long distance hiking, is that you have to hike through. You know, you have to keep going. You have to hike through the pain and through the weather and through the hunger. And it's that continuity and that process of setting a goal and not wavering until it's finished that is uh, that is that is really significant. And I think it was actually very good training for writing this book, which ended up taking me seven years to write. And you know, if I had just been focused solely on the joy of writing and not on completing the task, I, I would probably still be writing the book. I would have never finished it, right? So you need both of those things. You need the enjoyment and the appreciation of walking, but also keeping an eye towards the end point so you can orient yourself. ¿Y qué piensas? Hoy hay más gente sentada en una computadora mm -hmm. conociendo lugares por internet y no yeah. saliendo a conocer su propio vecindario. Yeah. ¿Cómo, cómo nos, nos cambia eso? Yes. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's something I think about in this book. So, so trails, first of all, the internet is, you can look at it as a very interesting uh, extension of, of our trail and our road network in the sense that originally if you wanted to connect two places, if you wanted to communicate with someone in another town, the way you did that was you walked a trail or you went along a road or you sent a messenger, right? But it was a physical journey. And those journeys become faster and faster and faster as history progresses. We get roads, you know, first we have horse carts, and then we have, uh, you know, we'll have trains, and then we have automobiles, and then we have, you know, at the same time, the information starts flowing quickly, right? You have the telegraph, and then you have the phone lines, and then you have the internet. And as each of these processes uh, speeds up, something is lost. You, you're losing the contextual and environmental knowledge that you would get by walking to go visit someone, right? If you went to go visit someone in the next village, village over, you would see on your walk there their local agriculture. You would see some of their local customs. You would see the local land. And then you would walk into their home and you would see their home and you would see the expression on their face. And all of these things would be context clues that would enrich your understanding of that person. And so you could communicate more deeply. I'm sure you've experienced this where you talk to someone in person, you have a very deep conversation, and you talk to someone else online and the conversation gets all tangled up and you can't communicate clearly. And I think part of it is because of what you're saying is, 
is that that context is lost. The, the, the surroundings. You're not getting out into the world and you, so you don't see the world that the person is living in. So I think that's a real danger of the internet that we've sped up connection to this point where we connect, connect to anyone anywhere in the world and yet the form of communication we're having is very impoverished. It's a thinner, uh, faster form of communication. Now in terms of traveling, uh, you know, I, it's a thought that's occurred to me and people have said before, well maybe people will stop traveling now because of the internet or especially in the era of virtual reality, they can go there, they can just put on a headset and see Rome, right? They can be standing on the Spanish steps. I'm not sure... Estos viajes en paquete donde vas cinco minutos a todas partes. Right, and those are... Yeah, that's another, I think that's another very impoverished form of travel. And not, not monetarily impoverished, but your experience is impoverished. You know, it's, you're getting a very thin slice of a place. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I would urge people, as you say, to get, get out there, even in their local um, neighborhood, you know. Just get out and walk around and talk to people. It, you know, it's an obvious thing, but it's hard to do because we spend so much time in our computers. ¿De qué vas a escribir? Esta es tu primera obra. ¿Seguirás este camino? ¿Eres más ensayista? So, so my next book is going to be uh, in a similar vein as this book. It's going to be called In Trees, and it's going to be an, uh, an exploration of trees, right? So starting with people who are fascinated with trees, uh, in the same way in this book I, I interview and I follow a lot of people who are fascinated by trails, who are studying various kinds of trails, insect trails, animal trails, ancient human trails, modern human trails. In the next book I want to find people who have that same connection but to trees. So people who have lived in trees, people who protest and shackle themselves to trees, people who, uh, you know, indigenous tribes that live in trees in, in, in Southeast Asia. And then from there to move down to the metaphorical and philosophical roots, which are this, you know, dendritic structures, these branching structures, so family trees, linguistic trees, the tree of life, right? Evolution itself forms this tree-like pattern. And, uh, and, and as well as our, our brains are made of, of neural trees, and, and in fact your brain, as it's expanding, uh, they call the process blossoming and pruning, you know, so your brain is blossoming and it's connecting all the parts of your brain, and as you grow older, you're deleting those neural connections one by one. And that's how you begin making sense of the world, is because you don't have too many connections. And of course, trees do the same thing. There's something very you profound. The history, the philosophical Everything. I mean, it's going to be a, a, a mixture of, of journalism and essay, philosophy, history, uh, you know, every you know, science, every, every, I'm sort of omnivorous in my interests. It's very hard to... And we are killing trees too. Of course, yeah. And trees, and trees are also the symbol of the environmental movement. They're, they're oftentimes the catalyst for some of our earliest national parks, you know, the redwoods, for example, uh, the Mariposa redwoods in, in Yosemite, uh, and John Muir were the, the deeply intertwined with how and why we began to appreciate the natural world in the way that we currently do. People still can stand beneath an old tree and feel a sense of reverence because trees soak up and embody history, right? You look at a thousand-year-old tree, and, it's, and there's something stunning and profound about that, and anybody who sees that tree cut down, I think, viscerally, there's a sadness there. And so that awareness has been growing. We've been spreading throughout the natural world to where we now, even places that we used to consider wastelands, you know, the, the desert or uh, swamps, we can now appreciate with the same reverence that we would a thousand-year-old sequoia. Very good. We wait the book. Yeah. <laughs> gracias, Rob. Gracias. Muy, muy amable. Muy Muchas gracias. Charlotte.